All right, so let's get started. Okay, let's uh, again, always give it up for DJ Adopt Tables. Thanks as always. How was your weekend? Uh, it was good, you know, I was recruiting. Uh, I went to TOC, uh, but they don't have any DJ jobs. They don't have any DJ jobs? Yes. Yeah, That's hard, right? Yeah. Actually, I found out Salesforce has in the lobby the main building in San Francisco, they have a DJ every morning. Oh, really? And it rotates. Oh, that's crazy. Do you want me to figure out how to get you that job or what? You uh, want to focus on... Can you put my resume? Just okay, yeah, I can see what I can do. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I think most people are at the TOC today, so that's why it's a low turnout, which is unfortunate because this is one of my favorite lectures, hash tables, right? So we have a lot to discuss, so let's get right through it. So real quickly, and then reminders for what's on the docket for you guys, what's due. Project one is due uh, next week on Friday at 27th at midnight. And then homework two, which we'll be releasing later today, that'll be due uh, uh, the 30th, the Monday after uh, the project. So any quick high level questions about project one? So like uh, the autograder, when will it be released? Say it again, the what? The autograder. The question is when would the autograder re be released? I mean, it's, it's live on Grayscope now. You can submit, you can submit things today. But well, we're not giving you the source code for the test, obviously, because that's when you use that to grade. Yeah, so it should be live. If you, if, you, if, it, if you submit it and it doesn't work, please post on Piazza. Okay? Any other high-level questions? Okay, so where we're at now for the course is that we've spent the first couple weeks, again, starting at the bottom of the stack of a database system architecture and working our way up. So we've discussed how to store data on disk, the pages on disk, then we talked about how to bring those pages into memory in our buffer pool or buffer cache and having, having a policy to decide when it's time to evict something, how to pin things when, when to do writes. So now we're going above the buffer pool manager and we're going to start talking about access methods. So these, an access method is a way we're going to you know, get, essentially read or write the data that, in our database that's stored in the pages that are stored out on disk. So today we're going to talk about, uh, or th 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 today will be the beginning of a, of, a, of a set of lectures we're going to do on data structures that we're going to maintain internally inside the database system. And we're going to split it up between two discussions between hash tables and, and order preserving trees. So each of them have different trade-offs, because you, you've taken an algorithms course by now, so you understand the implications for both of these. But we're going to describe what matters to us in the context of database systems. Because right, just because you have a tree versus a hash table, maybe understand how to do proofs on it or write algorithms to, to interact with it. Now let's talk about what, what happens when we actually put it inside a database system and actually try to use it. So data structures are used all throughout the database management system right, for, for a variety of purposes. So one thing we've talked about so far, we've shown how to use data structures for maintaining the internal metadata about what's in our database. And we talked about there being a page table or a page directory, and that was a hash table to do lookups between a hash ID, or sorry, a page to a, a uh, page ID to a frame, or a page ID to some a location on, on disk. The next thing we can use them for is actually just the core data storage of the database itself. So what I mean by that is instead of just having an uh, unordered heap, a bunch of pages, we can actually organize them at a higher level to be a hash table or a B plus tree, or tree data structure, and have the, the values in, in the data structure actually be tuples. So this is very common in, in a lot of systems like, like Memcache, for example, essentially a is a giant hash table. Or MySQL in a DB's engine is just a B plus tree where they store the tuples themselves inside of, inside of the leaf nodes of the tree. We can also use data structures to maintain uh, temporary data. So this would be like if we're running a query uh, and we need to compute something uh, very efficiently, we could build a data structure on the fly populate it with whatever data we need, finish executing the query, and then just throw away that data structure and be done with it. And the last one that's probably, probably you're most familiar with is using these data structures for table indexes, right? Essentially building a glossary over keys inside of our tuples and, and allows us how to do uh, you know, quick lookups to find individual elements that we want rather than having to do a sequential scan throughout the entire database. So for all these purposes, again, we, we need good data structures to do all these things. So the thing we want to care about in how we design our, our, our data structures is, is the two following things. So the first is we're going to care about what the data organization is, meaning how are we going to represent the key value pairs or the elements of the data that we're storing in either in memory or on pages that we're storing on disk. And we do this in an efficient way that uh, can support fast reads and writes 
uh, without having to do your know, major overhaul or major, major uh, restructuring of the entire data structure every single time. The second issue is that how are we going to allow multiple threads to access our data structure or multiple queries to access our data structure at the same time without causing any physical violations to the internal representation of the data. So what I mean by that is we don't want to have maybe one thread update a memory address while another thread is reading that address and then they see some torn write or some corrupt version of that address and now that points to some invalid page or invalid memory location where we end up producing incorrect results. So we'll see how we actually handle this. We'll, we'll talk a little bit along as, as we go along today, but we'll spend a whole lecture on discussing how to do concurrency control inside of indexes, inside of these data structures. But for our purposes today, we can sort of simplify the discussion, just assume we only have a single thread. And because this is going to matter later on also too when we talk about transactions, because the type of things we'll talk about here, we'll, we'll use latches to protect the physical data structure. That prevents from, you know, again, reading in invalid memory addresses or invalid page locations. There's also a higher level concept of what's the logical correctness of our data structure that we need to care about as well, and that'll come later on in, in the semester. So essentially, what, what I mean by that is, say I have an index, I delete a key. If I come back, my, my thread comes back and tries to retrieve that key again, I shouldn't get it, because I know it's been deleted. Even though the physical bit still may be there, because I, and I'll, I'll do some background garbage collection to clean up later on, but logically, my key should be gone, even though physically it's not. So that is, this, this, this topic is very complicated, and so we'll touch on it a little bit today, but mostly care about the physical, uh, the physical integrity of the data structure rather than the logical one. Okay. Today, again, we're going to focus on uh, hash tables. So a hash table is an abstract data type that we're going to use to uh, provide an unordered associated array uh, implementation, or API. And all that means is that we're going to be able to map arbitrary keys to arbitrary values. All right, there's no ordering to this thing like, like we're, we're going to see in trees. And so the way we're going to be able to do this, these fast lookups to find the elements that we want is that we're going to use a hash function that's going to take in our key and then compute some offset in some way to some location in my array. And that's going to tell me either exactly the element I'm looking for, or I can roughly look around close to by where, where I land after I use my hash function to find the thing that I'm looking for. So the hash function isn't always going to get us exactly where we want, but at least get us in the right location. And we know how to then look around to find the thing that we are looking for. So again, so this, none of this should be new. You should all take an algorithms class. So the space complexity in the worst case of a hash table is, is a big O-N. Right? That means that we, for every single key we want to store, we, we, we at least have one, one entry for it in our hash table. So we have to allocate that amount of memory, that amount of space. The operational complexity is interesting because on average, we're going to get O1 lookups, meaning we, in, in one step in constant time, you can find exactly the thing that we're looking for. Worst case scenario, and we'll see why this happens when we, in, a, in a few seconds, the worst case scenario will get a big O n, meaning we'll have to do a sequential scan or a linear search to find, to look at every single possible key to find that, that the key that we're looking for. So you may be thinking, all right, this, this is great, uh, any hash function or any hash table will do because I'm always going to get O1 for the most part. In practice, even though this is super fast, in the real world where money's involved, constant factors actually matter a lot. And so we'll see this when, when we just look at hash functions, right? Hash functions will be, you know, sometimes it'll be, it'll still be super fast, but there'll be some hash functions that'll be twice as fast or three times as fast as other hash functions. So you may say, all right, for one hashing, who cares? But if now I'm, I'm hashing a billion things, and my crappy hash function takes a, a second slower than the fastest one, now that's, I'm spending a billion seconds to do this lookup. So when there's real money involved, when we're looking at large scale, the constant factors actually matter. When you take your algorithms class, there's like, oh, one, we don't care about anything else, the constants don't matter. In our world, it does. All right, so let's look at the most simplest hash table you could ever build. Right? And all it is is just a, a giant array, which is mal like a big chunk of memory, and then we're going to say that every single offset in our array corresponds to a, a given element. And so for this to work, we're going to assume that we know exactly the number of keys we're going to have ahead of time, and we know exactly what, what their, uh, what their distribution of their values are, what, the, what their actual values are. Right? So now, to find any key in my hash table, I just take, the, take a hash on the key, mod it by the number of elements that I have, and then that's going to get me to some offset. 
And this is exactly the, the thing that I'm, I'm looking for. So let's look at see how this works. So let's say that again we have uh, three keys: A, B, C, D, D, E, F, X, Y, Z. So again, I can just take this thing A, B, C, D, A, B, C, hash it, and then that'll tell me uh, you know I'm at offset zero is, is exactly the thing I'm looking for. So this is not exactly what our hash table is actually going to look like because this is just storing the, the original keys. In practice, what we're going to need to have is actually store pointers to where the original you know some other location where that original key is, is located. Again, think of this like, like a table index. I don't want to store the keys maybe in my, in my hash table. I want to store a pointer to where the key is found. All right? So what are some problems with the assumptions we made with, with this kind of hash table? Yes, in the back. Uh, that we know the number of elements we knew in the first place. Exactly. You said that we know the number of elements uh, ahead of time in the first place. That's one. What's the second assumption? He says all the values are near each other in the cache. That does, for this purpose, that doesn't matter here. <coughs> there's no collision between keys. Perfect. He says there's no collision between keys. So what is a collision? Uh, they hash into the same slot. He says they hash in the same slot. Exactly. Right. So this really simple hash table. This is actually the fastest hash table you could ever possibly build, but you you have to make these assumptions in order to make it to work. Right. So the first is that, as he said, we need to know exactly the number of elements that we had ahead of time. So we know exactly how many slots we want to allocate in, in our array. And in practice, that's not always going to be the case. Right? If I'm building a, if I'm using my hash table as a hash index in my, in my, on a table, when I create the table, I don't, have any, I don't have any data in there in the first place. And as I start inserting things, then the number of slots I need actually grows. The other assumption that we mixed was that we said every, hash, or every key is unique, and that's what, he's, that's what he's saying, that there's no collision. So we're assuming that every time we hash it, it's always going to land into a unique slot for that one key and only that key, and we're going to be able to exactly find the thing that we're looking for. And so because we know all the keys ahead of time, and because we know that they're unique uh, when we hash them, this is using what is called a perfect hash function. So a perfect hash function is like this theoretical thing. It exists in the research literature, but in practice, nobody actually does this because it's impractical. You can't actually do this. And a perfect hash function just means that if I have two keys that are not, that are not equivalent, then whatever hash I, I, I generate for them is also not going to be equivalent. So for every unique key, I generate an exactly unique hash value. And again, you can't actually do this. There's no magic hash function that exists today that can guarantee this. The way you would actually implement a perfect hash function is actually use another hash table to map a key to another, you know, to the hash value. Which is kind of you know stupid because now you have a hash table for your hash table. Right? So nobody actually does this in practice. So the thing that we're going to talk about today is how do we actually build a hash table in the real world to not have to make these assumptions and be able to use them uh, in a database system. So when people say I have a hash table, they essentially mean it's it's a data structure comprised of two parts. The first is the hash function which is a way to take any arbitrary key and map, you know, and map it to an integer value in a smaller domain. Right? So I can take any string, any integer, any float, doesn't matter. I throw it to my hash function, and it's going to produce either a 32-bit or a 64-bit uh, hash, unique hash value integer. Or not unique, sorry, hash, hash integer. So there's going to be this big trade-off in, in what kind of hash function we're going to use between how fast it is and the collision rate. Because again, if we have different keys mapped to the same slot, that's a collision, and now we have to deal with that in our hashing scheme. So what's the fastest hash function I could ever build? Mod. What's that? Mod some prime number. He says mod prime number, even faster. That value. What's that? That value. He said that value itself. You're close, but what does that mean? If I have a string, how do I return back that value and then put it into my slot? Like you sum up like... Uh, even faster. It says bits of memory, but yeah, but if it's, if it's a large string. Just take the last whatever it is and then mod that last one. He said mod, there's a mod in there. Yes. Constant. One, <laughs> right? No matter what key you give me, I return back the number one. That's going to be super fast because that's going to be on the stack. That's going to be impossibly fast. But your collision rate is <laughs> because it always goes to the same slot. So, and the other end of the spectrum is that perfect hash function. But I said I need, a, I need another hash table to make that work. And that's like the worst case scenario. So my collision rate is, is zero, but that's the slowest. So we want something in the middle. 
Okay? All right, so the next piece is the hashing scheme. The hashing scheme is essentially the, the mechanism or procedure we're going to use when we encounter a collision in our hash table. All right? So again, there's this trade-off between memory and, and compute, which is the classic trade-off in computer science. So if I allocate an impossibly large you know, slot array, like you know, 2 to the 64 slots, because that's all the memory I have on my, on my machine, then my collision rate is going to be practically zero. Of course, now I can't do anything else in my database because I've used all my memory for my hash table that's barely even full. But my collision rate is going to be amazing. If I have a slot array of size 1, my collision rate is going to be terrible. Uh, and therefore, I have to do a bunch of extra instructions to deal with those collisions. But my storage overhead is, is, is the minimum. So again, is this, we want to be sort of in the middle here. We want to sort of balance the amount of memory we're using or amount of storage we're using for a hash table with the extra instructions we're going to have to do when we have a collision. All right, so today we're going to focus on, again, the, 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 we'll spend the beginning just talking about hash functions, uh, just get, to show you what, what hash functions are out there, the modern ones that people are using. And then we're going to talk about two types of hashing schemes. The first is static hashing, is where you, you, you have an approximation of what the size of the keys you're trying to store, the key set. And then we'll talk about dynamic hashing, where you can have a hash table that can incrementally grow without having to reshuffle everything. Again, the combination of a hash function and a hashing scheme is what people mean when they say, I have a hash table. All right, so again, a hash function is just this, this really fast function that we want to take any arbitrary byte array or any arbitrary key and then spit back a 32-bit or a 64-bit integer. So can anybody name a, a hash function, maybe one they've used before? He says SHA what? SHA-256? That's one. Can I name another one? Yes. MD5, perfect. All right, this is actually a great example. So he said SHA-256, he said MD5. SHA-256 is a cryptographic hash function that's actually reversible, right? It's a public-private public, public key thing. So given a, a key, I'm going to hash it, and then I know how to take that key and reverse it and get back the original value. He said MD5, which takes any arbitrary key and spits back a 32-character unique hash. That, in, it's not supposed to be reversible. It is now because people have cracked it. But that's something where it's a one-way hash. His is, a, his is a reversible hash. So in our database system, we do not care about cryptography for when we doing, we're doing hash tables. Now, that's, you, know, you, you can encrypt the data when you store it on a disk or on, on you know, a public cloud infrastructure. But when we're doing our hash join or and, and building our hash table, we're not going to care about cryptography. We're not going to care about uh, leaking information about our keys because we're just trying to build, this hash, you know, build our hash, hashing data structure. So we're not going to use something like, like SHA-256, because one, we don't care about the cryptographic guarantees it provides. It's also super slow, so we're not going to use it at all. MD5 is one is essentially a one-way hash, and that's something we could use for a hash function. We don't because it's super slow, and we'll see other ones that are, that are faster. And it's also supposed to be one-way, but people have rainbow tables to reverse it. So that it, has, it doesn't even have good cryptographic guarantees. All right, so again, we care about something that's fast, and we care about something that, that has a low collision rate. So the, this is just sort of a list of some of the hash functions that our people are using today. Um, so CRC is, is used in the networking world. It was originally you know, invented in 1975. I don't remember whether it was 32 bits or 16 bits back then. But now if you want to use CRC, there's a 64-bit version, and you would use something like that. Um, so again, this will produce something with a reasonable collision rate, and, but it's going to be super, super slow. So we, nobody actually does this in practice. So this is sort of, murmur hash sort of, again, from a database perspective, this enters the era of modern hashing functions. And these are the ones that we're going to care about. So murmur hash came out in 2008. It was just some, some dude on the internet posted up his, his general purpose hashing code on GitHub. And then people picked it up and then started using it. Uh, Google then took murmur hash in, in the early 2010s, modified it to, to be faster on uh, shorter keys. And then they released something called city hash. And then later on in 2014, they modified this again to, to have farm hash uh, that has a better collision rate than, than city hash. So farm hash and city hash are, are pretty common in some systems. What is now considered to be the state of the art and the fastest and that has the best collision rate in, uh, for hash functions today is actually Facebook's XX hash. And not the, the original one from 2012. There's a XX hash 3 that is actively under active, under active development now. Uh, I think it came out in 2019. 
So right now, this is the fastest and has the best collision rate of, of all these hash functions. So if you're building a database system today, you want to be using XX hash. So again, we don't care so much how this is actually implemented, right? I don't, this is not an algorithms class. I don't care what the internals are. Again, all I care about is how fast it is and what the collision rate is. And there's benchmarks to, to measure and the, the quality of the collisions, collision rates, all of these algorithms. So this is a benchmark, a micro benchmark I run every year. So this is like an open source framework that I took and modified that just scales up the number of keys you throw into the hash function and see how fast it can actually compute uh, hashes on things. So this here, we're, we're looking at from one to eight bytes for the key sizes, which is pretty small, right? When you think about you know, th essentially a 64-bit integer, but you, you want, this is beyond what like email keys or URLs will, will be. So at the really smallest level, right, the, the CRC actually does the fastest here. But then, of course, as you scale up, the, the, the farm hash, city hash, and the Facebook XX hash uh, do, you know, are getting much better. What really matters is when we actually look even larger key sizes, which is something like this. So now you see the CRC hash sucks ass, and no matter how much bigger the key is, the throughput rate is, is essentially the same. But you see these really nice spikes here for at 32 bytes and 64 bytes for farm hash, city hash, and XX hash three, right? And this is because the the the, the key that they're processing uh, that they're computing on fits within a single cache line. So as I do a single fetch into memory, I'm bringing in 64 bytes into to my cache, and I can operate on you know for that single fetch, I'm operating on all the data within that that cache 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 lookup. So that's why there's sort of the sawtooth pattern here. And then beyond this, I think after 64 bytes, city hash and farm hash switch to a different algorithm, and then, and then it's slightly different. Uh, you see slightly different properties, whereas XX hash still does uh, quite well. So again, I'm not showing the collision rate here, but there's benchmarks online that can show you that even though XX hash is actually the fastest here, it actually still gets a, a, a as good as a collision rate as uh, city hash and farm hash. So in our own system today, we're, we're, we're using XS hash as much as possible. So any questions about this? Again, a hash function just takes a uh, arbitrary key, spits back a value. Yes? Why don't we care about cryptographic properties? Because if we're storing like user-provided data, then the user could give us a bunch of data that's designed to uh, collide under our hashing algorithm if they know it, and then our database will run really slowly as a denial of service attack. So his statement, which is one I've never heard before, uh, is that it's possible that someone could give a um, someone could give a, a, a data in such a way that it, they know the the values would always hash to the same thing, and therefore you would have a uh, potential denial service attack because you're causing the 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 collision rate to be super large, and now for it's taking longer to run your queries. All right, let's talk about this. So one is uh, in the database world, at least the data that we're talking about here. The users are trusted, meaning I'm running Postgres in, on shop or whatever system in, in my own hardware. Whoever is supposed to give me access to that has already vetted me and trusted me, so I'm not going to be that, that malicious. Two, you also provide a seed when you do these hashings, so that one, unless it's hard-coded, you may not know exactly what that is. And then three, you may say, all right, well, what if, what if I'm on a cloud system and I, uh, you know, someone is malicious that way? Well. Google doesn't care or Amazon don't care because you're the one paying for the hardware. So if you give me keys that then hash to the same thing and your collision rate is super long, now your query takes a long time and they're just clocking your money. So it's not, it's not I'm sure you could think of a tech that does this, but it, for what we're talking about here in the internals of the system, nobody cares. Again, there's databases that will encrypt the data at rest on, on S3 or EBS buckets. That's a whole separate thing from this. Is there another question or no? Okay. Again, I there are cryptographic databases, uh, and people are spending a lot of money to, to worry about these things because data breaches are a big deal. I don't care at this point in my life. I'll get to the point, and then then I'll care, but right now I don't care. <laughs> All right. So, so again, we're not writing hash functions. We're just going to take one of these three, or you know, in general, we want to take XX hash, and that'll be good enough. Okay. Don't write your own hash function. It's not worth your time. All right, so let's talk about now how do we use our hash function in our, in, our, in our hashing scheme to deal with collisions. So again, what we're talking about here, it doesn't matter what hashing function we're using. Right? It could be the slowest one, it could be the fast one, fastest one. All these hashing schemes will still work the same because this is, this is what we're doing after we've hashed it 
after we've jumped to some location, and now we've got to figure out how do we deal uh, with collisions or how to find that thing that we're looking for. So we're going to start to talk about the, the most basic hash table you can have, called linear probe hashing. And then we'll talk about some variants to improve on this, potentially called Robinhood hashing and Cuckoo hashing. But they're all roughly based on, on linear hashing. And again, these are all static hashing schemes, meaning we have to be told at the beginning when we, when we allocate memory, here's the number of keys that I expect to store. And so that, in some cases, you actually can, can guess what this is. So when we do query processing and we're, doing, we're using a hash table to do joins, I roughly know, or I, I hope to know, that how many keys I'm going to have to hash in my hash table, and then I can allocate accordingly. If our hash table gets too full, and we'll see what that means, like essentially it means we have an infinite loop, or all our slots are filled, then that means that uh, we have to double, we have to increase the size, and essentially double the size of the hash table, and then basically take all the keys in the, in the first hash table and copy them over to the second hash table, which is obviously super expensive to do. So, we, so ideally, we can have a good approximation of you know, what the upper bound is for our, key, for our hash table size so that we don't have to do this, uh, to do this uh, regrowth or rebuilding. All right, so again, linear probe hashing, sometimes called uh, open addressing. This is sort of the most basic hash table you can have. And all it is is just a giant uh, uh, a table of slots. And we're going to use our hash function to jump to some offset or to, at some slot in that table. So if you, get a, if you use Python and you allocate a dictionary, this is essentially the same data structure you're going to get underneath the dictionary. It's going to be a linear probe hashing table. So the way we're going to resolve collisions is that if we hash into a slot and we find something that's already there, uh, if we're trying to insert something, then we just keep scanning down to the next position and keep going until we find the first open slot. And then that's where we insert our, the entry we're, we're trying to add. So now when I want to do a lookup, I would then land at the, the slot where I should have been, and I keep scanning down to I either find an empty slot, meaning the thing I'm looking for is not there, or I find the, the thing that I was looking for. Right? It's, it's, it's pretty basic. It's pretty straightforward. All right, so again, so let's say that these are the keys we want to add, right? and we have some hashing function that's going to take these, these keys and map them to our slot, to a slot in our hash table. Right? So this first one, we hash A, then it lands here. And again, inside of this thing, it's a key value pair. We have the original key. That, that we inserted, plus whatever the value that we want it to be. So if it's a pointer to another tuple, turn to another page, or you know, some other arbitrary value, it doesn't matter. And the reason why we have to store the key, the original key, is because when we start doing lookups and we have to scan down, uh, you know, start looking at multiple entries, we need to know whether the thing we're actually looking for in the slot is the key that we actually want. Because it, it's not always guaranteed to be exactly where we hash into the table. So if we hash B, B lands here. Now we hash C. C lands here, but again, A is occupied, the slot where C wants to go. So all we do is just jump down to the next position and then insert our entry into there. Same thing for D. D wants to go where C is, so we put it here. E wants to go where A is. It can't because A is there. Can't go where C is. Can't go where D is, so it ends in here. And the last one for F down here. Right? Pretty straightforward. And this is actually really fast to do. So I'm not showing the division between pages here, but you just look at this as like, I have, I've allocated a bunch of pages, and I know how to go from one position to the next. I know that if I'm in the last slot in my page, I know what the next page is to jump to to, to continue the, the search. Yes? Uh, if I want to insert another key in, for instance, E's position, yes. can I use the one below the B slot? Yeah, so because this is a circular buffer. So, if I, so his question is, say I want to insert G, and G wants to go where E is, can't, so it goes here, can't go there. It loops back around and continues here. Right? Yes? So you said that you scan down till you find an empty slot, that means it is not there. Yes. What if I delete a value? So the question is, what if I delete a value? Boom, next slide. Excellent. Okay. So let's say that we want to delete C. What do we do? Again, we hash it. We would land where A is. That's not what we want, because again, now we, this is why we have the exact key in there. So we can say A is not equal to C, this is not what I want. Scan down, ah, C equals C, that's the one I want. This is what I want to delete. So let's say I just do something really simple and just remove it. What's the problem with this? You go look for D and you value and you're going to say, oh, it's not there. Exactly. I do a look up in D. Uh, I look in here, I see an empty slot, and it's 
it's, I'm thinking, all right, my search is done. It's not what I want, even though it's the next slot down. So there's two ways to handle deletes. So the first is that you just add a tombstone marker. You basically take wherever C used to be and just add a little tombstone that says, there's not an entry, there's not a logical entry here, but physically consider this, uh, this slot occupied so that when I do a lookup and I land here, I say, well, th there's no data here, but it's not really an empty slot. Let me jump down to the next one, and that's the thing that I wanted. Of course, what's the problem with this? Now we are, uh, you know, we're, we're wasting space. We're, you know, we have to go clean this up later on eventually. So this contributes to our fail factor. The other option is to do data movement, essentially recognize that I have an empty slot here, and just move everybody up one, uh, and then that way I, I land exactly where I want to go. Now in this example, this, is, this works fine because E maps exactly to where, where it would be found, F maps to exactly where it would be found. But again, remember I said it's a circular buffer. So technically, B might actually want to go here. Because it is, it is technically comes after F, even though physically it doesn't. So in this case here, if I end up moving B around, this is going to be bad. This is going to be incorrect because B uh, hashes to that location. So had I moved it here, I would then do a lookup on B and find nothing. Because as, as I scan down, I'm going down this direction. I would not know to loop back around and look at the previous entry. So in practice, most people just do tombstones. Uh, because this, you know, this data movement thing is actually complicated. And this is another good example of why you want to have the original key in here, because in order to figure out whether it's okay for me to move this up by one, I need to be able to hash it and decide whether the thing, the location where it should be is uh, less than or up above where I, I, I want to move it to. Because if I, if I now go uh, above it, then I'll get false negatives. The ha I'll hash the thing and not find, actually find it. So, for some, some operations or some, some instances of a hash table in our database system, we don't have to worry about deletes at all. Again, if I'm building a temporary data structure to do a, queer, a query, I'm not going to have any deletes. I'm just going to scan my input data, populate my hash table, and then start using it. If we're using it as a hash index, though, then we could have deletes, and we have to uh, account for this. And tombstones is probably the most easiest way to do this. Yes? Yeah, so his statement is, he said, the movement is probably the worst way to handle this because I can't, say it again, I can't move things up above without... Why not? But that's okay. So if, if you go back here, when we first inserted it, right? right. That would work only if D, E, and F have the collision of Correct. A. So, all right. No, not necessarily, right? So, so F wanted to go here, but E's there, so it's okay to move that up by one. Uh, e wanted to go here, but it can't, so I, it's okay for move, move it up by one. And then D wanted to go here, and it can't, so it can move it up by one. So my toy example here, it's, it is perfectly safe for me to move up everybody up by one. But the point I was trying to make is we can't actually move B, because B actually wants to hash to there. Physically, it's not contiguous. Logically, it is, so I should have moved it here. But exactly as you said, I had to hash it and check to see, oh, is it safe for me to move it down here? In this case, no, because the hash actually wants to go there. So as I go down one by one, I have to say, is it okay for me to move it up? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so right now we're entering like around the like, key to the hash table. But well, like I was wondering like what's the ideal capacity of like the hash table comparison to like the keys? Because if like the, the number of keys is like similar to the hash table, we're like kind of making implementations of like, the yeah, so his question is, in my, again, super simple example here, uh, it's sort of, you know, I only have six keys. I can kind of estimate where, how many keys, that slots I need. In practice, how do you actually estimate how many slots you need? In practice, it's 2n. You have 2n the slots of the number of keys, or n's the number of keys you think you're going to put into it. Right? And we'll see in, um, in Google hashing, it's, it's slightly different because they have two hash tables. But in practice, it's 2n. And then what happens is when you, if this gets too full, this is now get filled, when you resize, you double the number of slots. It right? goes up by two. Yes? Um, 
Could you also, like, for the movement, could you just track, like, the number of shifts that each block took and then just, like, count down to zero? Because, like, B, for instance, didn't shift at all, so it would be at zero. So then you try to shift it, like, oh, it's already going to All right, so his statement, which is... <laughs> You guys are it's amazing segues. He's, he's saying, couldn't I also just record the position of where, how many steps I am away from my original position and use that to determine whether it's safe for me to move it? Yes. This is called Robinhood hashing. But we'll get to that in a second. All right. The last thing, the quick, I want to talk about uh, non-unique keys as well, and then we'll get to his, his point about Robinhood hashing. Um, so again, in, in your algorithms class, you probably, when you discuss hash tables, you just assumed all the keys were unique. For primary indexes, this is fine, but in practice, in, in real, 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 real data sets, we can't assume that the keys are unique. So now we need to be able to handle them in our hash table. So there's two ways to do this, and I'll say that the two ways I'm describing can be used for any of the hashing schemes that we're talking about today. Uh, they're not specific to linear hashing. You can use them for anything. So the first approach is just you maintain a separate linked list with all the values so that you have, say, your key in, in whatever your hash table is in your slot, and then instead of pointing to the, the underlying tuple or whatever the thing it should be pointing to, it instead points to uh, these separate uh, linked lists that have the values that, of course, that have all, all have the same key. So if I want to say, give me, all the, give me all the key value pairs for the key uh, x, y, z, I just jump along this and follow this pointer, and then I know that everything inside there has that key. The other approach, which is probably the most common approach, is just to store redundant keys. So all you do now is just in your, in your, your slot array, you're just duplicating the, the keys over and over again. Right? So I have the key X, Y, Z, A, B, C appears multiple times, and each one has a unique value. I'm just recording that multiple times. And in the case of linear probing, everything still works. That you know, If I'm, I'm looking for something, uh, I do my lookup, and I just keep scanning down until I find either an empty slot or the thing that, uh, or yeah, until I find an empty slot that I know my search is done. So if I'm saying find me one key instance with, with key value key equals x y z, I just could jump here and find exactly what I want. But if I want all of them, then I, I got to keep scanning down until I hit empty slot. Again, in practice, everyone does the the, the second one, even though it's it's you know it's slightly wasted storage because you're repeating the key multiple times. Whereas in the top one, you only store the key once. All right, so let's talk about the what he was sort of proposing to do. Um, but we're going to see this in a slightly different way. Uh, rather than deciding when to shift it around, it's, it's rather than deciding how to move bulk movement, how to have bulk movement of, of keys through our hash table, let's look at how to use these positions to move individual keys. So Robinhood hashing was proposed in, uh, in, in 1985. It's one of those papers that came out that no one really paid attention to. And then in the last decade or so, it showed up on Hacker News a couple of times. And, now people are, are, are trying out in, in different systems. So again, Robin Hood is this folklore tale from England about this, this rogue who would steal from rich people and give it to the poor people in, in medi medieval England. So that's essentially what we're doing here in our hash table. We're going to have poor keys steal slots from rich keys. And I'm defining poor versus rich, meaning the number of positions you are from away from where you should have been when you first hashed into the hash table. right? So to do this, the basic idea is that we're trying to balance out throughout the entire hash table to minimize the likelihood that we have one key that's really far away from where it should have been. So that we overall, we're sort of we're balancing everybody's equal. So let's see this. So again, we want to start these same six keys. A goes here. But now, as, as he was suggesting, we're also going to now store the, the number jumps we are from our original position when we first hashed into this. So our, our table was empty in the beginning. So when we hashed A, it landed this position here. It was exactly where it should have been. So we set its, its, its number jumps to be 0. Same thing with B. B hashes here. It lands at the, uh, at the top. So its, its position is 0. So now we insert C. And A occupies the slot where it wants to go. But in the very beginning, A is the number of jumps A is from its, from, its, from its optimal position is zero. And at the beginning, C landed here. So at this point, C's number, number of slots where C is from, from where it wants to go is zero. So since zero equals zero, we're going to leave A alone and make C go down to the next slot and take that. And now we see we updated its position uh, counter to be one step. So it's one step away from where it should have been when it first hashed into the table. So now we do this with D. D lands here. D wants to go in this slot, but C occupies it. But C's 
counter is one, and one is greater than zero. So a higher counter means you're more poor, I mean you're, you're farther away from where you want to be. So C would be farther away from where, from its, where it wants to go, where D would go if, if D took this position. So we don't let D take this slot, and we make it go down here. So now I'll look at one uh, where E, where E started up, wants to go where A is. Again, zero equals zero, so we leave A alone. One equals one, so we leave C alone. But now, E's counter is two, because it's, it's, you know, zero, one, two jumps away from where it wants to go. So two is less than, two is greater than, than one. So two is considered more poor than D. So it's, it shoots D in the head, steals its wallet, steals its slot, inserts itself here, and then now the insertion continues because D goes down to here. And now we update its counter to be two. So again, before we had it, we had A, C, uh, D, E, but now on a Robin Hood hashing, E is now closer to where it wants to be, and D is, is, uh, is farther away than when it should have been. Because overall, now, now we're, we're more balanced. Same thing for F, F will go here. Uh, two, is, or two is greater than, than zero, so D stays where, where it wants to go, and F goes down here. In the back, yes? So you'd rather have like, one element, like, like you'd rather have like, one, one, separated as opposed to two, zero? Yeah, her statement is, under Robinhood hashing, the, the, the algorithm says that it's better to have two keys be one position away from where they should have been, rather than have, having one key be two positions and one key be zero positions. Yes. I'm not saying this is the right thing to do. I'm saying this is, this is one approach to, to, to handle collisions a different way. The, the, I mean, you're essentially trading off reads for writes. So now when I want to do a lookup on any of these guys, all right, any of these keys, it's, there's not going to be one key that's going to be all the way, you know, wrap around all the way. Right? Everyone's going to be on average the same distance. Um, but in order to do that, that's making writes more expensive, or inserts more expensive, because now I have to write more things. So when I did this stealing here, let's say that I have to update this page. Right? There's, a split, there's a page split right here. So I update this slot here on, on the first page to install E. So that's one write. And then now i got to come down here and do another write to insert D into this page. Had I left them alone, like on a regular linear probe hashing, I would only done one write to the page. So again, this seems like a really nice idea. The, the research, at least the modern research shows that, especially for in-memory data structures, that you, you pay a big penalty for a branch misprediction because you have more conditionals to do these checks to see whether one should take it from another one, uh, and you're doing more writes, and that's more cache invalidation. So in practice, linear probing crushes everything, still. It's still the fastest way to do this. I think for disk, it's the same thing. Okay. Another approach to deal with collisions is instead of doing linear probing and just keep scanning down and possibly swapping things as on a, on a rabbit, Robin Hood hashing, what do we just, we just have multiple hash tables, and then we decide where you know which hash table to insert our our key, you know, is, is whatever which one has a free slot for us, so that we don't have to do these potentially long scans. So this is what cuckoo hashing is. So. Uh, I've always mistakenly said cuckoo hashing was named after like a cuckoo clock where the, the, the hand goes back and forth. It actually had to do with the cuckoo bird. The cuckoo bird is, is known to, to move itself from one nest to another. It's like it steals another nest from another bird, and that bird has to then move something else. So we'll see how that works in, in hash tables. So that, that's what it means. So lookups and deletions in, under cuckoo hashing is always going to be 01, meaning we're always going to jump. When we do a lookup, we're going to jump to... Uh, uh, to, you know, to our hash tables and find exactly whether the thing we want is there or not. We don't have to do any additional scans. But the inserts are going to be more expensive because now we may have to, again, ping pong or move keys all around. So uh, let's look at an extremely simple example with two, two hash tables. Again, in practice, most people that use this just use two. There are some people that use three. Beyond that, it's sort of impractical and it's unnecessary. So two is always sort of the right number. So let's say I want to insert A. So, for every hash table I have in my Google hashing setup, I have to have a, a, a separate hash seed for my hash function. So, I'm going to take this key and, and hash it twice. It's going to be the same hash function, like murmur or xx hash, but I'm just going to give it a different seed so that the, for a given key, it produces a different hash value. So, I'm going to hash A twice, my two, my two seeded hash functions, and the first one's going to land this position, and the second one's going to land in this position. 
So at this point here, my hash tables are empty, so I can insert in either one. So for our purposes, we'll just flip a coin, we'll say, let's insert it in the first hash table here. In practice, you can do more complicated things. You can say like, all right, well, what's the fill factor for my, for my hash table? Maybe always choose the one that's less full. Or if you have uh, metadata about the collision rate for these hash tables, you can make a better decision. As far as I you know, everyone just flips a coin and that's good enough. All right, random is actually very, very good for a lot of things. All right, so I'll say I want to insert B. Same thing, I'm gonna hash it twice. First one goes to this slot where A is already stored, but the second one goes to an empty slot. So in this case here, my, my choice is obvious, right? I always want to go to the, the one that's empty because I don't have to move anybody. I just insert it there and I'm done. So now let's insert C. Same thing, I hash it twice. Well, now the first hash function maps to this slot where A is and the second hash function maps to where B is. So now I need to make a decision which one I want to kill. Again, let's just flip a coin. That's going to be good enough. And to make the demo work, I'll pick this one, right? So we'll go now steal that slot from B and insert C. So now I take B out. Now I got to go put it back in the other hash table. So I'm going to hash it with the first hash function, and that's going to tell me where I go to insert it. But we, as we saw when we tried to insert it before, it wanted to go where A was. And so we have to now steal its slot, put B there, and now I'll put A in the other one. So we, we hash that, it comes over here, and now we've, we land to an empty slot. And so now our insert is to C is done because everybody has landed in, in a free slot. Yes? His question is, which is absolutely the answer is yes, can this have cyclic behavior? Can you be stuck in an infinite loop? Absolutely yes. So in that case, you have to recognize where, what your starting point was. So if you come back around and see, wait a minute, I've seen this slot before, and there's something there, I can't put anything in there, I'm stuck in an infinite loop. So that's when you resize. Okay, so again, the, uh, in practice, everyone always does just two hash tables. And again, you want to allocate this in such a way that uh, you know, the, the, the likelihood that you have a, a cycle is, is minimized. Okay, so now all of the hash tables that we talked about so far are, again, we're static hash tables, meaning I need to know approximately the size of the, of the number of keys I want to store ahead of time so I know how to allocate it uh, you know, allocate it to be large enough to, to that, I, that I minimize collisions and I don't have infinite loops or, or, or get completely full. All right, so again, as, as he's pointed out before, if you now have to resize it, either grow it larger, which is more common, but also shrink it if you want to reduce the size, you essentially have to rebuild the hash table entirely. Right, we'll talk about consistent hashing. There's, there's hashing schemes we, or hashing functions or methods we can talk about later in the semester when we talk about distributed databases that don't have to resize the whole thing. But for, for, for our hash tables inside of our database system, we are gonna have to rehash everything. Uh, or re rebuild our, 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 our hash table because now we change the number of elements when we mod n, the hash, hash value, and that means things that, aren't, that you know, were in, in one bucket or one location before, one slot, now could be in another slot, and I, you know, everything's gonna get all out of whack. So in practice, you just have to rebuild it from scratch. So this is what dynamic hash tables are trying to solve. That they're going to be able to resize themselves on demand without having to rebuild the entire thing. The most basic one is a chain hash table, and this is what probably what people mo most think of when they think of a hash table. But we're going to talk about two more complicated schemes from the 1980s that are still used today, extendable hashing and linear hashing. All right, so chain hashing or chain hash table or bucket hash table uh, is a dy dynamic hash table, we're going to maintain linked list of buckets for values that map to the same, or keys that map to the same, values that are part of the same key. So when you allocate a hash map in Java and the JVM, you get one of these. This, this, this is the, the default data structure that they use. So the way they're going to deal with collisions is that they're going to just keep appending uh, to the end of this bucket list. So, so each bucket chain can grow forever because you just keep adding more, more and more buckets. The link list gets even larger. And of course, this, this, this can obviously degenerate to a, uh, essentially a sequential scan, because if all my keys map to the same bucket, uh, bucket chain, then my bucket grows forever, and then I'm just, do, just doing a linear search. And I'm, I'm no better than just you know, reading from a table. So insertions and, and deletions are pretty straightforward, because you're just modifying the buckets. You're not actually modifying the, the slot array. So again, it just looks like this. We have our slot array. These map to buckets, 
and then any single time I want to do an insert say, to, to this, this bucket chain here, if my last bucket is full, I just allocate a new one and I keep appending things until here, until I, to, you know, until I run out of space and allocate the next one. So you can think of these buckets as just pages, right, in, in, in the table heap or, or on, on the heap file, and I just allocate new pages and chain them together uh, using page IDs to figure out how to you know, traverse along it. Again, this is pretty straightforward. This is pretty easy to implement. Uh, the, the, this is actually super easy also to make uh, thread safe because all I do is just take a latch on either the slot, which is the, the easiest thing to do, or just the individual page uh, anytime I'm modifying it. So those, let's look at more complicated schemes. So with extendable hashing, we're going to take the chain hashing approach uh, with the buckets, but instead of letting the linked list just grow forever, we're going to uh, we're going to split them incrementally. And the key difference here between rebuilding, uh, splitting and rebuilding is that we're only going to split the the chain that overflowed rather than the entire the entire uh, data structure and the entire hash table. So in order to make this work, we're going to allow multiple slot locations in our slot array to point to the same bucket chain. And that it'll make more sense when I show it in the next slide. Um, and the advantage is, again, is that the, the, when we have to move data around, we're only moving the, the bucket that overflowed and not all of the other buckets. All right, so it's going to look like a chain hash table, except we're going to add some additional information. So the first thing we're going to have is this global counter that corresponds to the number of bits we have to consider when we want to figure out what bucket to look at, or what slot to look at, uh, in our hash function. So in this example here, we'll start with the global counter too. And then for each, for each bucket chain, or each bucket, we're going to have a local counter that corresponds to the number of bits that we use to get to that location. So in this case here, this first bucket uh, has a local, uh, local counter of one. So that means that we only need to look at one bit to address into it. And this is why if you look at 00, zero and zero, 01, both of these guys map to the same bucket because the first bit zero is the same. Because this bucket hasn't overflowed, we haven't had to split it yet. Whereas the, the other two buckets have 1011, and because the, our local counter is two, that says we have to look at two bits. So the global counter you need to tr figure out what, how many bits you need to look at, the local counter is just in, for your own sanity internally to understand what the, you know, how did you get to the location where you're at. Right? But you don't actually need this to figure out you know, how did you look up in the slot array, because obviously you can't, you can't know what this is until you do the lookup through the slot array. All right, so let's say I want to find A. So then again, I'm going to hash it. I'm going to produce some a bit sequence for my, for my hash value. And then I look at my global counter, and it says, how many bits do I want to examine in my hash function or my hash value to decide where do I want to jump to? So my global counter is 2, so I only need to look at the first two bits, 0, 1. I do my lookup in my slot array to look at 0, 1. I follow the pointer, and then I land to the bucket that I want. And now I just do a sequential scan to find the entry that I'm looking for. So now let's say I want to insert B. So again, global counter is two. I only need to look at the first two bits. I land here, follow the slot array. This guy had a free, free location, so it's safe for me to go ahead and insert this. It is never flow. But now I, I want to insert C. First two bits are one, zero. I follow this. I land here, but now I see that I don't have any more free entries in my, in my bucket. I'm going to overflow, so now I have to split this. So in the splitting process is I look at my global counter, and it's now set to 2, so I'm going to increase that to 3. So that means I'm going to need to examine 3 bits. So now I'm going to double the size of my slot array to now account for 3 bits. Again, this operation is cheap because this is just an array of pointers. So I take a latch on it, protect it, resize it, and then put it back in. So it's not like I need to move around any of the data here, which is the more expensive part. So now my global counter is three, and I'm going to split this by then now examining the three bits instead of two, and to figure out which hash table or which bucket they, they belong to. So this guy just slides down. I restructure this thing right, to, to split the data that, that was stored between that single page. I remap everybody based on the, 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 the local counter. So this guy up here, again, we still only care about one bit. So there's two slots that map to it up there and two slots down here that also map to it, where again, where the first bit is zero. 
So then now, it's, now I want to go back and, and try to insert C. So now I look at three bits. That tells me I want to look at this position here. I follow the pointer, and then I'm able to insert into it. So again, this, this, this movement here looked like it was kind of expensive, like stuff sliding around. But all I'm doing is just splitting that one page I had before to make another page. So it's two page, page writes plus the pages you have to update for the, for, for the slot array in the back, yes. Her question is, is it not considered to be expensive to remap the slot array to all the new pages? No, because all I'm really doing, like these are still at the same page ID in, 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 on, on files on disk. So now I'm just updating this, again, it's a, it's a single array. I'm just updating the value to now point to, uh, you know, where the data is actually stored. So this operation is cheap. Moving pages is, is expensive. Yes. Right yes. So her question is, what if say the first one fills up? What say what would happen? Well, now I would split it, and again the lo the local counter is one, so we I would increment that to two. Now yes, yeah, so now it's split on two, so now it would be zero 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 one zero 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 one. So anybody with zero zero here, these two entries would point to the same thing, and zero one zero one would point to the same thing. Delete stuff and go okay. A few, few more slides. Okay, we'll get to that. Deletes, yes. Deletes are you basically reverse this. In the back, yes. His question is: Are you storing the entire page ID page in the in the slot array here, or is it just a page ID? It's just a page ID. In the bucket, like this is this each bucket would be a page. Yes. His question is, what is the relationship between a hash table and a buffer pool? So I, at a high level, I'm, I'm ignoring that. In practice, depending on whether you want it to be durable to disk, you would allocate a page, just as you would for, a, for, for a, a, tube, a table, right, a slotted page, in your buffer pool, and you can store a bucket page in there. Same thing. The buffer pool doesn't know, it doesn't care. You just say, I, give me a page, here's the page ID, it hands you back some, some memory address, and you can write some data in there. It doesn't know whether it's part of a table or part of a, a hash table like this. Like a data table or a hash table. So again, all the same eviction algorithms you would use. Now you, you kind of see like how we're jumping around this and accessing our, our hash table is certainly going to look a lot different than how we jump through and do sequential scans in a, in a data table. So maybe you want different caching policies for them or eviction policies. Yes? The statement is, am I, I'm using three bits at this point here to map hash values to slots. And then it tells me what offset to jump into, right? And then within that slot in this array, I would have a page ID that, that I could then follow to get to the, the bucket. So how is the mapping from the page IDs to the buckets? How does the mapping from page IDs to buckets work? Yeah, I thought, I thought it should be one to one. It is, right? So like, there's... I'm using the term bucket, again, instead of a page, because it, this could be in memory, it could be back by disk, it doesn't matter. Okay. But you can think of, if, if it was back by disk, then this, these are just page IDs. And the bucket is a page. And they're, they're synonymous. So the only thing I need to store here is just page IDs. Okay, because you have like multiple values in the global page ID that they map into this. Absolutely. So the statement is, again, going back up here, at this here, my global bit counter is two, but I know that I haven't split this first page here. Its local counter is one. So even though if I want to do a lookup, I have to look at two bits, but in, in, in practice, I only care about the first bit for this page here. So that's why these guys have the same page ID, bucket ID, whatever you want. They, oh, yeah, they can map to the same location because they have not split yet. After we have reached a page, we'll just do linear scan. The statement is, which is correct, is after we do a reach a page, we just do a linear scan to find the thing we want. Absolutely, yes. Isn't that expensive? The statement is, isn't that expensive? Uh, again, if I have a billion tuples, then doing that lookup to scan an 8 kilobyte page is nothing. 
And you say, all right, I, I want to be a bit more crafty, but smarter. Well, maybe I store a, a filter or some little uh, pre-computed information at the top that says, the key look, you know, here's the list of keys that I have. It doesn't tell you where they are. It just says that you have them. So you can do that quick lookup, see whether it's there. But like that linear scan is going to be super cheap compared to reading it from disk or having to do sequential scan on the entire data set. Okay. So the other dynamic hashing table is called linear hashing. So one problem with the, uh, with the extendable hashing, well, it's not a huge problem, but that we're going to have to double the size of the, the slot array. Again, computationally, it's not that expensive. But while I'm doing that resizing, I have to take a latch on it, prevent anybody from reading and writing it until I reallocate everything. So that will become a bottleneck of everybody's trying to go into the, to my hash table at the exact same time. So with linear hashing, the idea is that we're going to localize the resizing to just be whatever the, 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 the bucket or that, that overflowed. So we don't have to take a global latch that locks out everybody from accessing our, our hash table. So the way this is going to work is that we're going to maintain multiple hashes, hash functions, same way we did in cuckoo hashing. Again, it's the same hash function algorithm, just different seeds that are going to tell us where to jump to the right bucket for a given key. And we're going to maintain this new thing called a split pointer that's going to keep track of what's the next page we want to overflow or what we want to split. And then we incrementally increase the size of our, our slot array. So how we decide when to overflow can depend on what, what we want to do. It could just be when we run out of, of, of entries in our, in, our, in, our, in our bucket, and then we, that triggers a resize. It could be if the size of our bucket is larger than the average size of all the buckets. Again, it's left up to the implementation. Um, they all have different trade-offs. All right, so it looks like this. So again, we have a slot array that's going to now point to buckets, just like an, on a chain hashing. So again, we're going to add this now, this, this new split pointer that's going to keep track of what's the next bucket we want to split whenever we have an overflow anywhere in our hash table. So we're going to split the, the bucket point to by position zero whenever any other bucket, not just when bucket zero gets overflowed. So if any of these other guys overflow, we will, we will split zero. Even if, even if it's not the one that overflowed. So at this point here, we, uh, our split pointer is at, the, is at the beginning of our slot array. So we only have one hash function. Right? And then we're just going to mod it by the, the number of entries that we have. So let's say I do a lookup on, on six. I just hash it, mod by four, I jump to the location, do a linear scan until I find the key that I want. Right? That just works just, just like before on your ch chain hashing. But now let's say I want to insert 17. Right? I hash it, 17, mod four, I land to this position here, but now I don't have any more free slots or free entries in my, in my bucket. So I'm going to have to create an overflow bucket, right? essentially just create again the chain link list, and then that's where I insert 17. But because I now overflowed, that's going to trigger a split wherever the split pointer is pointing at. So even though zero still is, is, can take entries in it, I overflowed once somewhere, that's going to cause me to overflow. So the way this is going to work is that we're going to add a, uh, one new entry to our slot array, now position four, and then we're going to have a new hash function that now mods by 2n. Right? And the idea is that as we keep splitting down and down, we'll keep adding new entries until we're 2n or two, twice as big as where we were before we added, you know, before we started doing splitting. So the way this is going to work is that we need to keep, the split point is going to keep track for us whether we want to use the first hash function or the second hash function. Because it tells how far along we, we split in, in our slot array. Right? So in this case here, we, do, we, uh, we add the new entry 4, we create a new bucket, and then this is where we insert 20 into. And we move the split pointer down by one. So the split pointer is essentially this, this demarcation line here. So it basically says that whenever I want to do a lookup, I first hash it with the first hash function. So I say I want to do a lookup on 20. I hash it with the first hash function, and that's going to take me from 0 to 3. And then if the thing I'm pointing to is above where that demarcation line is for the split pointer, then I know that the, the bucket that I'm looking at has already been split so therefore, now I need to look at the second hash function and decide where I really want to go for this data. So now when I do a lookup at 20, 
I, uh, I hash it, use the second hash function, I mod that number by 8, because that's 2 n where I started at, and then that tells me that I want to jump down here. Same thing, I do a find on 9. 9 would land here, that's below or above the split pointer based on what, how you, you know, perceive it. But it's, you know, it hasn't been split yet, so therefore I only need to look at the first hash function to find the thing that I'm looking for. So is, this, so is this sort of clear? Yes? So the question is, back up here, when I inserted 17, isn't this what overflowed? Why did I split the first one and not this one? Because that's the way linear hashing works. The algorithm works that you, own it, you split whatever the split pointer works at, looks at, no matter whether this thing, whether it was one that overflowed or not. Because eventually, like if this thing keeps on overflowing, that'll keep moving the split pointer down by one. Eventually, I will get to this. I will get to everyone, split, split it, and then loop back around and start over again. When we uh, split one, we'll copy the 17 to the, uh, we'll copy the overflow to the split bucket, right? So the statement is, if I end up splitting this one here, right, say the split pointer moves down, now I split it, I will then, you know, use the second hash function to decide how to redistribute them. Yeah, so we'll redistribute both the uh, overflow and the... Correct, you redistribute all the, all the, the values, or all the key instances that map to that, th that bucket. And then delete the overflow. And, and then delete the overflow, yes. Now, it may be the case that, like, say this guy was, you know, this overflow thing was at the bottom here. So I, I kept inserting to it, I kept overflowing, and I kept triggering splits. And then by the time I get down to, to, to split it again, it may also overflow as well. That's just the, how the algorithm works. And you loop back around and do it again. So worst case scenario, the, everybody's inserting to the same bucket, and it takes a long time for it to split. In practice, though, with a good hash function and a low collision rate, this, sh this shouldn't happen. Okay, so the, uh, right, so again, splitting the bucket just basically means that uh, although we're not splitting the one that overflowed, eventually we will get to it, and eventually everyone will get split, and then everything will balance out. So in this example, I only showed inserts. The pointer can also move backwards if you start doing deletes. And same way, again, you can reverse the extendable hashing if you want to start deleting things to start coalescing, uh, coalescing buckets. But in practice, though, this is quite tricky. So let's go back to where we were before, right? Split pointer was pointing here, uh, and we've only split it. We only split the, the 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 first entry, position zero, in a slot array. So now, if I want to delete twenty, so I hash the first one that takes me to zero, but z this position here is is you know above our demarcation line for the split pointer. So I need to hash it again, and I land here. And now I can find the entry that I want. So now I'm going to delete this guy. And now the page is entry, empty. So I could just leave it alone and just assume that later on I'll go ahead and, and fill it up again. But if I wanted to start doing compacting, I want to start reclaiming memory, then I just do all the same steps that I did before and reverse it. Right? So I, I blow away the bucket, blow away this pointer, uh, move the split pointer back up by one, and now this thing goes away, my hash function goes away, and I've reclaimed the memory. Right? Just getting, just doing all the steps in reverse order. Yes. Um, do you like potentially like remove hash functions like once you kind of split all of the tables? Like, His question is, do I eventually remove hash functions after you remove all the tables? Uh, yes, I think after you get down to the bottom, I think at most you have two hash functions. Instead of twenty, if I had to remove eleven, then also the same thing would have happened. His statement is, if, instead of moving 20, if I also delete, delete 11, would the same thing happen? Instead of 20, only 11, like, so that uh, there is space for that to come. Okay, no. I'm, I'm missing what you're saying, sorry. sorry. Yeah, you can't redistribute, because, because again, the hash function is, it has to be deterministic. Same key should always produce the same hash value, so we know exactly where to find it. In the back. Uh, but you wouldn't do it for, like, key, um, key values, which only have one hash function, but it's a key to read it. Yeah, so her statement is, if I go back here, if I was here, uh, and I deleted six, six I would have to leave there. Correct, there's only one hash function, so if I try to remove this, I can't resize this one down here. So I just leave that empty, yes. So let me take it, I sort of flashed it already, but what's, what's, a, what's an obvious problem why this would be 
uh, problematic. If I if I do actually you know, deleted the page and removed it and then put the split pointer back up by one. Exactly. What if the very next thing I do is insert 21? Now I overflow. Now I got to split whatever thing's pointing at, and I just do all the same crap over again. Right? So, again, the, this is what I was saying that like, when you decide to do an overflow, maybe you don't want to do it exactly at the moment you, know, you insert something into an overflow chain. So maybe you wait till this thing overflows again, and then you, then you split it, or, or um, two pages become, buckets become empty, and then you start reversing. So, People that have spent a lot of time making the inserts go fast, deletes are harder to do because in practice, um, it might be just be, some cases it might just be better to rebuild the entire index. But you can do incremental deletes with, with these data structures. Okay? All right. So um, the, we spent today talking about uh, hash tables. Again, these are fast data structures that, that, that on average will do O1 lookups for uh, for, for, you know, to find keys, and we're going to use this all throughout the internals of the database system for as we execute queries, for, for page tables, intermediate data structures. Um, in practice, though, in for, at the application level, a hash table is usually not what you're going to want to use for a table index. Database systems will let you do this. Some systems will say, when I call create index, I want to use a hash table. But when I call create index in most systems without any specification what data structure to use, I'm not going to get a hash table. I'm instead going to be getting an order preserving index. And this is because a hash table can only do exact key equality predicates, equality lookups. Meaning if I want to see whether a key exists, uh, I have to have the entire key to do a lookup. I can't do a partial key lookup. And I can't say, find me all the keys less than my given key. Because again, the hash function can't do that for you. So in practice, this is not what you're going to use, and we'll do demos uh, next time with MySQL and Postgres, and we'll, we'll show the performance implications of this. So instead, what you mostly get when you call create index is the beloved B plus tree. It was called the ubiquitous B plus tree, a ubiquitous data structure in 1979, uh, and 40, 50 years later, it's still the, the best data structure out there, in my opinion. And pretty much every single database system is going to have some kind of B plus tree implementation. Except for those systems that are like, you know, memcache that are just a hash table entirely. Every single major data system is going to use something that looks like a B plus tree or, or a straight up B plus tree. Now, the, 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 they're going to differ on how they actually store things and, and do searches in some ways. But at a high level, what we'll talk about on Wednesday will be the sort of the canonical B plus tree. And again, it's, it's everywhere. Okay? So any questions? Oh yeah, coming through with my shell and crew. Two cent for a case, give me St. Nas blue. In the midst of broken bottles and crushed up cans. Met the cows in the jam, oh how dry oh, yeah. It's with St. Nas in my system. Crack another, I'm blessed. Let's go get the next one and get over. The object is to stay sober. Lay on the sofa. Better yet, down my shoulder. Who be the wallaby champ? Stressed out, could never be sun. Rick and say jelly, hit the deli for a cold one. Naturally blessed, yes. My rap is like a laser beam. The boards in the bushes. St. Nas been in the canteen. Crack the bottle. I love the St. I sip it through those who don't realize that drinking ain't only to be drunk. You can't drive, keep my people still alive. And if the same don't know you from a can of paint, paint.